Three candidates are looking to represent the largest congressional district geographically in New York State, New York 21. And tonight, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik and her two challengers, Mike Derrick and Matt Funicello, go head to head in a debate in this election 2016 special. From the Prime Link studios of Mountain Lake PBS, this is an election 2016 special, the 21st Congressional District Debate. Hello everyone, I'm Tom Halleck with Mountain Lake PBS, along with our PBS partners WMHT-TV in Albany, WPBS-TV in Watertown, and our colleagues at North Country Public Radio, we're hosting the third and final debate among the three candidates running for New York's 21st Congressional District seat. We're broadcasting this debate on all three PBS stations because New York 21 covers a lot of territory. It is the largest congressional district in the state, covering 12 counties from just north of the Capital District all the way to the Canadian border and spanning across the North Country from Lake Champlain to Lake Ontario. Let's begin by introducing our three candidates tonight. Starting from left to right, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik is the Republican incumbent from Willsboro, New York. Matt Funicello is the Green Party candidate from Hudson Falls, New York. And Mike Derrick is the Democratic nominee from Peru, New York. We will have one minute opening statements from the candidates and then we will meet our panel that will ask the questions and we'll also go over the ground rules. We are going to uh, begin now with opening statements. We drew straws to decide who goes first. Mike Derrick is going to begin, Mike. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Mike Derrick. I'm from Peru, New York. That's about 12 miles down the road. I went to high school in Plattsburgh, just a couple miles from here. In the summer of 1981, I went to West Point, and that began 28 years in the U.S. Army. During that time, I was stationed in three different countries, 10 of our great states, and I had 17 different jobs in the military, among them commanding soldiers in combat, I had the privilege of teaching some of our brightest young Americans history at West Point, and I served as a diplomat overseas, representing our nation with both our allies and our adversaries, each one of those jobs leading and solving problems. I'm running for Congress because I look at what our kids have today, and I look back at what we had as young people, and I believe that they have less opportunity than we did. In order to fix that, we need to fix our Congress. And the best way to do that is to change the people in Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Derrick. Ms. Stefanik. Thank you. First, I want to thank Mountain Lake PBS for hosting tonight's debate. And I also want to thank my opponents, Matt and Mike, for running for office. I think that's important to thank anyone who raises their hand and steps into the arena. My name is Elise Stefanik, and I am honored to serve as your Congresswoman. Two years ago, when I ran for this district, I ran on the idea that we needed new ideas and a new generation of leadership in Washington. And I'm proud to stand before you two years later to say that we have delivered those results. Whether it's fighting for small businesses and North Country manufacturers, or whether it's fighting to ensure that our family farms continue to be strong for the next generation. And most importantly, whether it's advocating on behalf of our veterans in this district. I'm proud to have set the standard of bipartisanship, energy, and accessibility when it comes to representing my constituents. And I'm looking forward to the next hour of debate. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Stefanik. Mr. Funicello. I'm Matt Funicello, and I am running on the Green Party ticket for Congress. And the uh, primary reason is that I'm local. It's very rare that you actually find somebody who is a resident of the district they are going to run in. Uh, we've had these issues with a lot of the major party candidates that have come to run because we're such a huge district. Uh, my father was born and raised in Ballston Spa, New York. My mother was born and raised in Gloversville, New York. My father's a Paul Smith graduate. Um, I've lived here all but 12 years of my adult life and the 12 years I spent in school, I also spent my summers on my father's farm. I'm a bread baker, a working class bread baker. I'm a bad hockey coach, I'm a co-op founder. I'm also a peace activist. And I'm running with the Greens because of single payer healthcare, the healthcare we already pay enough public money to have for everybody in this country, but don't. I am also running because we need a peace dividend, we need to do something about climate change immediately, and we need a living wage. I'm just asking voters today, be brave, vote green. Thank you, Mr. Funicello. Now let's meet our panelists who will ask the questions tonight, beginning with Zach Hirsch, a reporter with North Country Public Radio, Joe LaTemplio covers government and politics with the Plattsburgh Press Republican, 
And Matt Ryan is the managing editor of New York Now, the Emmy Award-winning political program, which is broadcast on all three of our public TV stations. We also have volunteers from the League of Women Voters of the North Country with us who have partnered with us for many years here at Mountain Lake PBS and are the official timers. Let's go over the ground rules. The candidates will get one minute for opening and closing statements, one minute to answer questions. There may be follow-up questions from the panel. Candidates get 30 seconds to answer those and 30 seconds for any rebuttals. All right, now on to our first round of questions, and Zach Hirsch will start us off. Zach? Thank you, Tom. We have a national election with two of the most polarizing candidates in modern political history. With Hillary Clinton, big questions have been raised uh, about her trustworthiness, her use of private email server while Secretary of State. Uh, Donald Trump has also offended huge groups of people, Muslims, uh, women, Mexicans, prisoners of war. There's also Jill Stein, uh, who has very little experience holding elected office. Do you fully, unequivocally support your party's nominee for president? We begin with Mr. Derrick, one minute. Thank you, Zach. Yes, I support Hillary Clinton, and she is clearly the best choice that we have for president of the United States. On the other side, we have Donald Trump, and you've heard me say before that Donald Trump has neither the character nor the competence to be president of these United States. He has called into question some of the things we hold most dearly. For example, last week calling into question whether or not he would accept the results of the election. He has insulted women, he has insulted gold star families, and he has changed political culture in this country. And I, for one, find his conduct dishonorable, and I ask myself how my opponent, Elise Stefanik, can still stand with Mr. Trump in this election, despite the fact that every other woman in Congress in the Northeastern United States has stepped away from him. Thank you, Mr. Derek. Mr. Funicello, you're next. One minute. Uh, very simply put, it is easy for me to support my candidate because she's not horrific. Uh, as Zach has pointed out, she isn't the most experienced. She's only held one minor office. But Dr. Jill Stein is not only a Harvard-educated doctor, she's also actually a medical instructor from Harvard. You don't g attain that position without being a fairly brilliant human being. Uh, to juxtapose this woman who is running based completely on the issues and being excluded uh, from much of the media coverage and also from the debates uh, that her other opponents were frightened to have her in, apparently. Um, and I, I don't have any respect for Hillary or Donald Trump on that level at all. It's our democracy. If you're ballot qualified, you should be in the debate, just as I am here in the North Country where we do take our democracy seriously. The rest of the country should, too. I would say this about Donald and Hillary. Donald is definitely a train wreck of a human being, but he insults people. Hillary Clinton kills them, and that status quo is one I want to change. Mr. Funicello, thank you. Ms. Stefanik, one minute. I've been critical of both candidates running for, running for president, and I'm running to be an independent voice for this district, just like I have uh, serving the past two years. I will be supporting the Republican nominee because he is willing to work with the Republican Congress on tax reform, on reducing our regulations, on defending our Second Amendment rights. But I will continue to be critical and I will continue to speak out when I disagree. I disagree with Mr. Trump's rhetoric towards women. I disagree with his belief that we should have a religious test for immigrants to this country. I will continue to be an independent voice and will continue to speak out. I'm proud to be ranked the 21st most independent member of Congress and the 13th most independent Republican out of 247. I could just follow up for Congresswoman Stefanik. You've described yourself as a role model and an advocate for young women in politics. Uh, Donald Trump has disparaged women in vulgar and sexual terms repeatedly. Uh, so if a young woman asked you about your reasons for supporting Mr. Trump, what would you tell her? I will continue to be a role model for women in this district, and I know the challenges of being a woman running for office. In fact, my Democratic opponent at his campaign event, I was called Elsie the Cow by one of his supporters, and he stood by silently. I will speak out against sexist rhetoric, no matter if it comes from a Republican or a Democrat, and I have spoken out against Mr. Trump's comments. Thank you. Our next question comes from Joe LaTemplio. Um, over the past two years, f uh, farmers have seen a drop in milk prices by about 40%. Uh, the dairy compact being what it is, a lot of farms are struggling. They're going out of business because of these low milk prices. 
what can be done about that? Mr. Funicello, we start with you. One minute. Um, essentially, one of the issues that faces us that we haven't talked enough about and we haven't heard almost anything about at the national level is climate change. And I'll explain how that does uh, involve itself very clearly with uh, your question about dairy in the district. I've scared some people by saying something that is true, that if you look at the UN uh, Agriculture Report of 2006, livestock agriculture is actually the major cause of climate change. Uh, it's 51% of the methane gases that are responsible uh, for global warming. Now, if we understand and accept that, as the scientific community has, we would understand that we need to transition from dairy farming and from beef and pork farming and poultry. We have to find more plant-based solutions to our food and resource needs. Uh, in this particular district, we've seen the direct effect of centralizing agriculture, making it corporate, uh, and filling up with subsidies these major farms that are really businesses not farms. Support small, support organic, and support as much plant-based as possible. We wouldn't have these problems with, uh, with the dairy industry per se. Thank you. Ms. Stefanik, one minute. So I have an agriculture advisory team made up of two farmers from each of the 12 counties, and that includes a dairy farmer from each of the 12 counties in this district. And I've spent a lot of time visiting our dairy farms. One way that I think we could address the low milk prices is by reopening up the MPP program in next Congress's farm bill. We need to make sure there's an insurance program for our farmers when there is a lull and there is a low point when it comes to milk prices. Additionally, I think it's important particularly along the northern border um, to continue to increase our dairy exports. Um, that is a growth opportunity for our dairy farmers in the district, and I will continue to be a voice for our cheeses and our various milk products here, but mainly we need to reform the MPP program in next Congress's farm bill. Thank you. Mr. Derrick, one minute. Dairy farms and apple growing in the North Country make up much of who we are. And unfortunately, between the low, the, low the low price of milk and this summer's tremendous drought across the North Country, our dairy farms have taken a one-two punch. And if you look at our federal programs, the farm bill, which favors our, large, our grain crops, does not do enough for things like apples and dairy. And so if I went to Congress, I would address these and, and also try to level the playing field because our small, dairy farmers are the ones who are most at risk here. The big dairy farms are able to absorb some of this loss, but it's the small producer who's had a tough summer growing hay and bringing in silage crops that's felt this the most. And so we need to level the playing field for our dairy industry in general and our small farms in particular. Okay. <clears throat> Should we get rid of the compact altogether and the, the price, uh, setting the price and just let the free market uh take care of itself? 30 seconds. Um, the answer to that is yes, we should. We should do that with everything. We say that we are into free market capitalism in the United States. If we are, why is our government so heavily invested in subsidizing, which really means manipulating centralized corporate agriculture? Many of the, the larger farmers that I have met in the district and, and that I've already known uh, do not want to be in a debt spiral in which their entire system of farming is controlled by the government. That is not freedom of any kind. Um, but we also have to again look at the environmental devastation that occurs when we focus monocrop agriculture um, on our soil, air, and water. Ms. Stefanik or Mr. Derrick, would you like to weigh in? I don't think we should get rid of the compact. I think we should institute reforms, and I think farmers in the North Country need to make sure their voices are heard. That's what I intend to do in the next Congress, to address some of the uh, broken aspects of the last Farm Bill to make sure that uh, they are in a stronger position uh, in the next Farm Bill. Thank you. Mr. Derrick. We should not get rid of the compact. We should make it, we should tailor it such that it supports all of our dairy farms, in particular the small ones. Climate change is going to pose an increasingly difficult environment for our farmers, big and large, to grow their crops and to produce their goods. And so we need that guarantee so that in the midst of all this turbulence, they have the ability to feed our nation and the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Now let's go to Matt Ryan. This question will be for Lee Stefanik. Thank you, Tom. College affordability is a major issue here in 2016. We have some great universities in this district, but there are many out there who either can't afford it 
or end up with a massive student loan uh, at the end of their time. Hillary Clinton on our website has proposed free tuition at four-year public colleges and universities for in-state students whose families earn less than $85,000 a year and free tuition at all community colleges. Is this a plan you can support? I support the plan that I've put forward. So I serve on the education committee. That's a committee assignment I fought for. And I specifically serve on the higher education subcommittee. I have spent a great deal of time at the SUNY schools in this district, SUNY Plattsburgh, SUNY Potsdam, SUNY Canton, as well as our community college, Clinton Community College, SUNY Adirondack, um, and the private schools, St. Lawrence and Clarkson. We need to make sure that college is affordable and it has accessibility, uh, no matter what your socioeconomic background is, which is why I introduced the year-round Pell Grant bill, which has bipartisan support from the lead Republican and lead Democrat on the Education and Workforce Committee. Additionally, as a millennial, the student loans crisis we will be facing is historic. I think we need to come up with innovative ways to tackle the student loan crisis, which is why I introduced legislation that is gaining co-sponsors by the day uh, that allows employers to match their employees' student loan repayment program tax-free so that uh, young people are able to pay off those student loans faster. Mr. Durek, one minute. When my father began at Plattsburgh State University in the 1970s, the state and federal government picked up 80% of the cost of education for those students. Now, the, the government picks up 20% of the cost and 80% of the cost is carried by the student and their family. As the only former university professor on this stage, I understand the power that college education brings. And we as a nation need to make the decision to invest in our young people and to give them the advantages we had as young people going forward. So yes, I support in public institutions making tuition free for state universities and also communi community colleges. And by the way, we have 10 educa higher education institutions across this great district. Thank you, Mr. Funicello. One minute. Very simply put, education in this country is a matter of priorities. Um, it's a very interesting fact that it's almost exactly the same amount of money that 43 million Americans owe in student loans, $1.3 trillion, as it is to pay Lockheed Martin to develop the F-35 uh, the newest generation of stealth plane that doesn't work as well as 40-year-old planes like the F-16 and F-18, which shoot it out of the sky in almost every simulation ever done. Why are we wasting all this money on war? Why aren't we spending this money on our children and our children's children? And the answer is because our priorities are pretty messed up. And I'm going to say again, Greens have an answer, and it's really simple. Reinvest in our children. Those 43 million people could have debt forgiveness. It could be done through quantitative easing or a bailout. We do it for massive corporations and banks all the time. $37,000 is going to be the average student loan debt that a 2016 graduate has. What's it going to be 10 years from now? It's time to change this conversation in, in Congress and allow for that issue to enter and that priority to be made. Thank you, Matt. Do you have a follow-up? Just um, for Mr. Funicello and Mr. Derrick, uh, we heard Ms. Stefanik's explanation, how would help pay for that? She mentioned the Pell Grant. Uh, in your 30 seconds, what are some of the ways that we, we can pay to make this uh, a p idea possible? Is that me first? Sure. Uh, I would say very simply, as I said in my answer, the F-35 would be a good option. Let's not give Lockheed Martin $1.3 trillion and let's instead reallocate that. Uh, that's of course not going to happen. We have a military industrial congressional complex to fight. They're not going to fight it. Democrats and Republicans are the military industrial complex. So let's look at the other answer. The other answer is a president, if we vote for Jill Stein, will appoint a Federal Reserve Chair. And at that point, there would be massive pressure. Uh, if Jill Stein was elected, to make sure that Federal Reserve Chair could use QE, uh, quantitative easing, which is what we used in almost all of the previous bailouts. Ms. Stefanik or Mr. Derrick? Mr. Derrick? So let me just address very quickly Matt's idea that we unilaterally disarm and slash the military in order to pay for education. We don't get the world as we want it. We get the world as it is, and we as a nation have a role to play we play a very important role to, cre to create stability across this world, and part of, that is part of that burden is borne by our U.S. military. On the other, the other point to your question is that if we were to enact tax reform in this country and do it effectively, we would have plenty of resources to fund education as we have proposed. Ms. Stefanik, if not, 
Mr. Funicello, you have the final word. Um, I just wanted to say very simply this. Mike is saying that I want to slash and burn the military budget. I do want to slash it. And I'm talking about in what way? The F-35 project. I'm talking about the boondoggles we have to suffer because we allow the military and the defense contractors to run our government for us. That has to stop. You're not going to get that to stop by voting Democrat or Republican. I'm not saying there is not a need to occasionally act as a military. I'm saying prior to World War II, we didn't have a standing army. Now we have 900 military bases overseas. That's insanity. We're the empire. We need to stop being the empire and focus on our needs here at home. Next question from Zach Hirsch. Let's talk again about climate change. All three of you say it's real. We've already spoken about the farm bill, the dairy industry. Uh, in the next Congress, what do you think should be done to combat climate change? And name your top realistic, achievable, concrete thing that you would propose as a member of Congress. Mr. Derek, we begin with you. One minute. OK, thank you, Zach. Very, very important topic, especially here as we live in northern New York State with the Adirondack Park. Climate change is real, it's upon us. If you look at this summer, we've suffered drought across the North Country. This year is the hottest on record. Last year was the hottest before that. And so we have to deal with it and we have to do it quickly. We don't have much time remaining. If I were in Congress, I would try to pass a national energy policy so we can move from a fossil-based fuel energy system to one that favors green power. And there's many creative and good ways to do that using market forces, and that is something significant. I would also point out at this point that my opponent, Elise Stefanik, says she understands climate change is real, but has consistently voted against the things that could improve not only climate change, but our health for those of us who live in this district. Mr. Funicello, your next one minute. Uh, climate change really comes down to words. Uh, we hear a lot and have heard a lot from Hillary Clinton over the last two months about how progressive she is about climate change. But prior to that, as we know, not only from WikiLeaks, but from her 30-year record of uh, being uh, involved in politics, shall we say, uh, certainly being a senator and also being the Secretary of State, this is the fracking queen of the world. And she's going to tell us she's going to do something about climate change. I'm personally not going to believe that for a second. That's called lying. We need to stop lying to ourselves because climate change is too serious. This isn't taking a buck out of the, uh, you know, the honor box at the, the local retail store or church. This is messing around with our ability to survive as a species on the planet. Hillary is not going to do anything constructive about it just because Bernie scared her for a couple months. The same is true for the Republicans. You know, the best that they could do is Elise has worked with Chris Gibson to say, all right, we admit it, there is climate change. The Greens are saying Green New Deal. Let's employ 20 million people, full employment, uh, living wages, single payer health care, rebuilding our infrastructure and rebuilding a fossil free United States of America, depending on renewable energy. Ms. Stefanik. Our environment is our economy in the North Country, and I have been privileged to work with the Adirondack Association of Towns and Villages, the Fund for Lake George, Save the River, and other environmental groups across the district. We need to find a balanced approach to, uh, to tackle our long-term environmental issues while protecting our domestic economy. My record demonstrates that I've been an independent voice when it comes to Republicans, Republicans in Congress on this issue. I've supported the tax credit for solar and wind energy development. I fought to ensure that in our DOD uh, budget, we are able to pursue contracts with renewable energy sources, such as biomass. I advocated on behalf of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which goes to incredibly important projects around this district. But the key is we need to pursue policies that will not raise our energy prices, which are costly, particularly for our seniors in this district. I want to invest in innovation and to continue investing in those renewable energy sources through tax credits. And uh, Mr. Derrick, rebuttal. Let's be very clear here. Elise Stefanik has the second worst environmental voting record in New York State, 9% as figured by the League of Conservation Voters. What, how she has voted and what she says are entirely different. And when we have this wonderful environment here in northern New York State, including the Adirondack Park, that is something which is absolutely inconsistent with representation in this district. Mr. Funicello, Ms. Stefanik. 
I have the 13th most independent record when it comes to Republicans in Congress. While Mike is worried about scorecards from Washington, D.C., of an organization where he didn't even earn their endorsement because we have a positive working relationship, I'm working with environmental groups in this district to make sure that we uh, pursue the correct approach, which is a balanced approach, protecting our jobs while also protecting our environment. Uh, follow up on that. Congressman, um, there are several parts of your record you mentioned that uh, are pro-environment, yet you did vote against the Clean Power Plan. You've repeatedly voted to weaken clean air, clean air regulations. Why? So the Clean Power Plan, I have concerns with the lack of enforcement with other developing countries around the world. Climate change is truly a global problem, and when you look at uh, countries like China and India, there needs to be enforcement. We need to ensure that they're also pursuing environmental friendly policies. And I think we need to invest in innovation. Um, I was one of the original co-sponsors of the bill with Congressman Gibson, um, and I've taken criticism from some members of my own party, but I will continue to work with anyone, no matter what party they're from, as long as the approach is balanced, conservation, and economic development. Rebuttals, 30 seconds. Mr. Funicello? I would just like to say that we keep hearing the word economics. Elisa said it a number of times in relation to the environment and climate change. Uh, David Suzuki said recently that economics is, and I'm not going to repeat the word, but it has to do with excrement coming from a cow's behind. Um, that's what he called economics, as long as it does not include the environment. If you have a bunch of circles and tables that are not including the environment, it's just calling our death an externality, then those economics should not matter. Every single bill passed by Congress should from here on in have a climate change contingent in it where we're trying to reduce carbon uh, PPMs. Next Thank question you. from Joe LaTemplio, and it goes to Mr. Funicello. Thanks, Tom. Um, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, has been a, a trade deal talked about by a lot of people. It's been panned by a lot of people as a potentially horrible trade deal designed for and by and for major corporations. Uh, what are your thoughts on TPP? I, uh, I said at the Green National Convention in Houston um, that I voted for Bill Clinton. That's the only time I voted for a major party candidate in the presidential election in my lifetime. Uh, and I was very sorry for doing so. And the main reason why is because he signed NAFTA and GATT with the promise most Democrats make that we're gonna tweak it a little bit so it's not a Republican bill anymore. Well, that was lesser evil gone to the other end of the extreme. Since NAFTA and GATT were passed, we've lost nine million manufacturing jobs, good union jobs in this country. They're turning us into a service industry economy. And by they, I mean massive multinational corporations that run our government and that are controlling our political representatives through Wall Street. Now what we have to look at is with TPP and with TTIP, we are looking at the end game here. We are looking at a loss of sovereignty that's unbelievable. We're looking at giving our big pharma companies control uh, over other nations and their negotiating power that's absolutely disgusting. This is ruling class oligarchic behavior that needs to be ended. We need to pull out of those free trade deals and we need to renegotiate fair trade. Ms. Stefanik, one minute. I don't support TPP. I will only support a trade deal if it will benefit our North Country manufacturers. I voted to ensure that there was transparency as part of the process so that any trade deal would be made public for 90 days so that the public and various stakeholders have an opportunity to review it. I also ensured that Congress will have a vote if any trade deal were brought up in Congress. TPP is not going to be brought up in this Congress because I have been one of the Republicans that said I will not support it. However, it is important when we're talking about trade to recognize we're in Plattsburgh right now and so much of our uh, local economy is dependent upon our economic partnership with Canada. Uh, today we're having a welcoming reception for Norsk Titanium. That is a great manufacturer that's opening up a facility right here. We need to continue developing that economic and trading partnership with Canada. Thank you. Mr. Derrick, one minute. I do not support the TPP because it favors wealthy and powerful corporations and individuals, and it does that at the expense of small business. Small business in our society no longer has a level playing field. And you can't, for example, in the town of Plattsburgh or the city of Plattsburgh, find a small business department store. Yet we can find many big boxes. Though that is why TPP is not good for our nation. That doesn't mean all trade is bad. 
uh, we are on the Canadian border here. The Canadian border should be an engine for economic growth. And we just need to look at whether or not these trade deals on balance will make things better for those who work in this country and the small businesses that are the primary driver of our economy. Thank you. Matt Ryan, next question, and it goes to Ms. Stefanik. After the election, we will begin to see a number of uh, stories discussing President Obama's legacy. Uh, using the current lines, he won this district in both 08 and 12. He currently has one of the highest approval numbers for any second term president this late in their tenure. Uh, at this point, of course, still about 90 days or so, do you believe his legacy is a good one? And it's easy to say it's a mixed bag, but would you lean towards good or bad at this point? I believe that his legacy when it comes to foreign policy will be a bad one. Uh, if you look at the number of crises around the world today, if you look at a resurgent Russia, a China who's continuing to assert its military might, a fundamentally flawed Iran nuclear agreement, um, I believe that looking back on the past eight years, the world is less safe. Um, I, I'm hopeful that on the House Armed Services Committee on which I serve, we can invest in our defense, invest in our military readiness, continue to rebuild alliances with uh, particularly allies in the Middle East like Israel that have suffered under President Obama. Um, but no matter who the next president is, I am going to work with the next president. I believe that Congress should work with any president on uh, domestic and national security issues. Thank you, Mr. Derrick, one minute. Thank you. Think back to 2009. Our nation and the rest of the world was poised on the brink of economic meltdown that was brought to us by the previous administration run by George W. Bush. President Obama walked us back from that disaster, walked the entire world back from this, that disaster. And in the, in the following years, we've seen consistent economic growth. He's reduced the deficit. And in fact, when we had about 180,000 soldiers committed to combat when he took over, that number is now down to 15% of that number. So on balance, given where he started and where we are today, this has been a remarkably successful eight years. And it is to the credit of President Obama and his leadership that we did not have a, an economic meltdown and that we are no longer so heavily engaged in combat overseas. Mr. Funicello, one minute. Uh, very interestingly, Barack Obama certainly could have used the, uh, the landslide victory, as he would refer to it, and as George Bush referred to his own non-victory in 2000, uh, to truly change our country. It could have been like a Roosevelt moment. Um, I heard so many of my friends who are Democrats say, we know he's a corporate Democrat, but he's also the first African-American elected, and we believe him even though he doesn't have a record. We really can hold his feet to the fire. I'm hearing the same rhetoric about Hillary Clinton this time around. The problem is that as a Republican veteran who spoke to me the other day said at a campaign event, I voted, he said, for Barack Obama because I thought he would get us out of our wars. I heard people say that all the time in 2008. I knew he wasn't gonna do that. And in fact, if you look at George Bush, he had us in 63 countries with our troops illegally because it's unconstitutional to put them there when they haven't been, when a war has not been declared by Congress. Obama has us in 138 locations with armed troops, and we have more mercenaries or defense contractors, as we like to call them, employed than at any time in history. Thank you. Now some questions sent in to us by our viewers to our Facebook page. To all of the candidates, what are you going to do about health care? Our insurance has gone up 75% since Obamacare. Based on her question, do you keep the Affordable Care Act? Does it need to be fixed? If so, how? Or do you repeal it? And if so, how do you cover the millions who have no health insurance? Mr. Derrick, we begin with you, one minute. Thank you, very important question. 18% of our national economy is tied up in health care. We spend too much for health care and we do not get the value we need in return. And you look at any other developed nation in the world and we are upside down in that equation. Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act has been a good step in the right direction. However, we have a U.S. Congress which for the last six years has failed to improve and build on this program. Any large piece of legislation needs enhancement and needs improvement. Some significant things can be done to improve it. We need to reduce the cost of pharmaceuticals, especially to our seniors, but to our entire society. 
And we need to reduce the overhead and profit that the insurance companies have carved out of our medical system. I also believe that we should move incrementally to a uniquely American brand of single payer healthcare because that is what will give us that value versus cost, uh, that'll put that value cost equation in balance. Thank you, Mr. Funicello, one minute. Very simply put, there's a great answer to health care that we don't hear often enough because we keep electing Democrats and Republicans to office and they depend on big pharma money and on money that's coming in from uh, the insurance industry through Wall Street, which both of my opponents take the money from. Uh, and they say they're going to offer us a plan. Mike says he's going to offer us a uniquely American form of single payer. I say, why have it be uniquely American? The system we have right now is a travesty, and all of the single payer systems around the world work better than ours. They have a better result. People live longer. They're healthier. Everyone has access to care. Very simply put, on an economic level, we already pay enough in public money to have the best care of any country in the world. We don't give any of it back for free to our citizens. We're spending $6,000 per person per year out of the Federal Reserve to support big pharma and the hospital industry. All I'm saying is why don't we spend the same $4,200 every other industrialized nation in the world does to have that better health care they've already got. You take profit out, you, uh, you recognize we have a $19 trillion deficit, we're already deficit spending, and you use that money for something intelligent rather than for CEO profit on Wall Street. Thank you, Ms. Devonick. This is a really important question. Every week since taking office, I have heard from families, I have heard from small businesses that who are seeing their health care costs rise, whether it's double digit increases in their premiums or higher deductibles after the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Despite Mike's misinformation, I have voted numerous times to improve and fix broken aspects of the Affordable Care Act. In fact, the biggest fix, the repeal of the auto enrollment mandate, was authored and introduced by me, and I was so pleased to see it signed into law by President Obama last December. Additionally, we've repealed the medical device tax, which was onerous on our medical innovators. What I believe we need is a new direction and a replacement for the Affordable Care Act. We need patient-centered health care that works in rural communities. We need to invest in a health care program where you can purchase across state lines. We should keep aspects like allowing young people to stay on their parents' plan until the age of 26. I also think it's important to invest in medical innovation, which is why I've advocated for the 21st Century Cures Act, which will set research and innovation goals to tackle diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, etc. Thank you. Our next question comes from a viewer who says, My boyfriend works two jobs about 60 hours a week. He makes $10 an hour at one and $11 an hour at the other. My job pays $10 an hour, and we have a four-year-old son. We are part of the growing number of working poor in this nation. What are your plans to create jobs and give the people of this district and this country greater economic security? And this goes to Mr. Funicello first. Very simply put, uh, we have some economic issues facing the working class. Those are two words or a phrase you're never gonna hear. Uh, on a stage that has Democrats and Republicans on it. And the reason is because they're not working class. They're middle class and ruling class people who are running to represent major multinational corporations. They're not representing you and I. We work for a living. And they're asking us to work for $7.25 an hour. And that's a crime, that is wage slavery. Roosevelt put the minimum wage in place saying, it should be enough that if you work a full-time number of hours in a week, you should make a decent living. The Greens have two answers. One is let's double the minimum wage at the federal level to $15 an hour. This leads to wage-led growth. I am the only employer and business person standing on this stage. I can pay that money, especially if I'm not giving Walmart and, and uh, McDonald's and GE all of my additional money in corporate welfare. But the other answer is a Green New Deal. Let's offer WPA style jobs to up to 20 million Americans who need a real job with real health care, rebuilding our infrastructure and switching us over from fossil fuel to fossil free energy. Thank you, Ms. Stefanik. We need to grow our economy. We need to create jobs so that minimum wage is truly a starting point and you can invest in your future and have higher wages and that companies are investing. Ways we could pursue that are fundamental tax reform, 
throw out the tax code, start from scratch, and write a 21st century tax code that allows businesses to invest. Additionally, on the education front, I support workforce development training. We should be investing in our future workforce, and I think we're in a unique position in the North Country to partner with our higher education institutions and our manufacturers to ensure that the high skills they're looking for that are good paying jobs, they actually can find them in our workforce. So I would support increasing those programs. Uh, but, but I believe it is about economic growth broadly across this country. Thank you, Mr. Derrick, one minute. We are the wealthiest and most powerful nation in the world, even in human history. And yet somehow we've managed to normalize poverty in this country. And the example of the person who's working two jobs and still not making it, that's present across the North Country. And I meet people like that all the time. They're my neighbors in Peru, New York. We need to do some fundamental things in our society to create living wages. Number one, we ought to get the money out of politics because right now the voice of the people has been diluted. All those people who are struggling to make it, their voice in Washington is diluted by the power of big money that has changed our democratic process. And we need to fundamentally as a nation decide that we are going to invest in infrastructure. In the 1960s, 2% of our GDP went into infrastructure investment. That created jobs and those were living wage jobs. Right now, it's half of 1%, one fourth of what we did in the 1960s. We have our priorities backwards and we need to set our priorities starting in Congress to care for the people in this country. Thank you. Rebuttals, Mr. Conicello. I have to say very simply this, that if you are going to get us a living wage, Mr. Derrick, what you are gonna to need to do is not be a Democrat. Um, and you're accustomed to that because you have been a Republican much of your life. And what I would ask is, when you switched parties, did it occur to you that your party, the party that you are running with right now, doesn't support a $15 living wage, it doesn't support a $20 living wage. What it supports is the slavery wage. And in fact, in the last election cycle, my opponent, who was a Democrat, was offering us 10, 10 an hour, just enough to get us off all of the benefits that we require if we are working poor. Why will you not support $15 an hour and why won't your national party? Mr. Derrick? In New York State has taken a very uh, positive approach to this issue in that it has a regional uh, minimum wage and it'll be $15 in New York, in New York City, and it will be 1250 up here. Our North Country at this point, and our small businesses for that matter, need a transition plan to get to $15 as a minimum wage. And I, I agree, it must be done, but it must be done in a way which doesn't crush our small family farms and our small businesses across the North Country. Thank you, next question from Zach Hirsch for Ms. Stefanik. Uh, so Donald Trump has doubled down on his claim that the election is rigged against him. He won't say whether he'll accept the results, breaking a long tradition in our democracy. And it's not just Trump. A lot of uh, people believe the election is somehow rigged. Um, so for Congresswoman Stefanik and really all three candidates, what do you say to those voters? And do you see any evidence of widespread voter fraud uh, either across the U.S. or here in this district? Well, I disagree with Mr. Trump on this issue. The election is not rigged, and uh, having run in a primary and general election before, um, I understand that the poll workers in our district, they're our neighbors, and what's uniquely American is there's a Democrat and there's a Republican. So I have full faith and confidence in the outcome of the election in this district and across this country, and I would, ur I would urge candidates across this country to accept the outcome. Mr. Derrick, one minute. Thank you. Elections in this country, the election process is sound. What is, where the problem resides is that money and politics have changed and diluted the voice of ordinary Americans. And we see that right here in this district. Last week when Elise Stefanik's re campaign realized that she was in trouble, there was an infusion of half a million dollars from Washington to prop up her effort. And this is where money and politics, it doesn't affect the election machinery, but it affects the outcome of elections. And we see it right here in our 21st District of New York State. Mr. Funotello, one minute. I certainly think that most of us who are watching the Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton primary are aware that there are rigged elections in this country. A lot of Democrats and Republicans now say, well, don't worry though, this is the general election and that's different. No, it's not. 
It's not. If you look at the WikiLeaks of the last week, what we have learned is that the Hillary Clinton transition team is already moving into place. Many of us have believed from the start that Donald Trump, who is a lifelong Democrat and donor to the Democratic Party, is really probably just running to help Hillary get elected. She's very unelectable because of her positions and what she's done in her lifetime. And the reality is that having Trump run gives her a juxtaposed candidate who's so horrific that of course we have to look at her as the rational choice. I would say this, in 2000, we know that the Diebold machines were rigged in Florida. We're aware of it. Democrats didn't fight to fix that. Greens did. And the reason we did is we value democracy. No more computerized voting. We need to go back to paper ballots. I'm not being a Luddite about it. I'm saying it's a lot harder to cheat that way. And they're going to cheat this time and they're going to keep cheating until we decide we've had enough of it. Next question is from Joe LaTemplio to <clears throat> Mr. Derrick. Trump's running to get Hillary elected. I'm not, I'm not saying that is the case. I'm saying that there definitely has been uh, a lot of speculation about that. And given how horrible a candidate he is, it's believable. <laughs> okay. Uh, going, I'd like to go back to the presidential uh, candidate uh, issue for a second. Each one of you, do you think your party's presidential nominee candidate has the ability to be an effective commander in chief? Hillary Clinton certainly has the ability to be an effective commander-in-chief. She has served at the highest levels of government for decades. And um, she understands how the system of government works. She has the experience across the world to understand the role we play in this world, which is vitally important if you are going to be someone in command of our armed forces. However, if you look at the alternative on the other side, Donald Trump is remarkably unprepared to be commander-in-chief and that has been shown time and again in this election with his ignorance for example of the role of nuclear weapons and how they are controlled. Mr. Funicello, one minute. Very simply put, we are probably going to end up with Hillary Clinton as the president. That shouldn't be a shock to many of us. But we don't really know because the polls are not obviously including third party candidates. And there's a huge number of undecideds, not only in our congressional district, but at the national level as well. Uh, it's one of the reasons why they're not doing official independent polls, I believe, in this district and in this election specifically. When you look at the national level, Hillary Clinton is very experienced. She is going to maintain the status quo. And by status quo, I mean illegal coups in Honduras that kill tens of thousands of people. I mean continuing to work to make sure that the minimum wage in Haiti is 30 cents. So she and all of the Washington elite can continue to benefit by using slaves in Haiti and pretending that they are friends of people in other nations. Also, what about the Iraq war vote? This is what you get when you vote for Hillary. I'm not suggesting you vote for Trump. I'm suggesting you vote for Jill Stein instead. We're looking at living wages. We're looking at single payer health care. We're looking at debt forgiveness and free college for people who are students. Uh, and we are looking at a full employment program and a transition to fossil fuel energy. We all want this. Let's vote for it instead of voting against what is awful. Ms. Stefanik, one minute. It's no surprise to the viewers that I have been critical of both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. I have focused 100% on being a voice for this district and on my work in Congress. I'm concerned about Hillary Clinton's lack of transparency, her, her decades ethical lapses, um, her careless use of a private email server, the pay to play news we hear about from the Clinton Foundation. I'm also concerned about Mr. Trump's rhetoric. I'm concerned and disagree with some of his policy positions. My focus will be making sure that Congress is in a strong position to be an independent leader, to have a balance of power when it comes to working with the next administration. Thank you. Matt, your question is to Mr. Funicello. We hear the term gun control often in state and national politics. Do we have enough? Do we need more? Uh, simply, do you support any additional measures of gun control legislation? Um, essentially, we're the largest weapons dealer in the world. 80% of the weaponry that is being sold to any of the countries that are involved in any of the illegal wars we are also in. And I say illegal because, again, Congress didn't declare them. We used authorizations for military force, which I believe are unconstitutional, as do many other Americans. Now, what does that have to do with gun control here in the United States? It has everything to do with it. We are propagating uh, and we are propping up a very corrupted system of uh, the fomenting of violence all around the world. So why do we have so much violence here that is associated with guns? 
It's not my 22 or my 12 gauge shotgun that's the issue, and yet it seems to be the focus of much of the hysterical legislation like the SAFE Act in New York State uh, that doesn't really uh, deal with the actual problem of gun violence in the United States. Most of that is handgun violence, most of that is homicides and suicides. Why are we crafting legislation based on hysterical mass shootings, most of which have been done by our own citizens? We need to pass that law that says 90 days before you put forward any gun legislation based on a mass shooting. Ms. Stefanik, one minute. The North Country has a long history of responsible gun ownership, and I am proud to be a strong advocate for our Second Amendment rights and broadly our constitutional liberties. One of the reforms that we've passed in Congress deals with our mental health. We have successfully passed bipartisan mental health legislation to focus more on rural care, to get rid of duplicative programs so that we truly have a comprehensive mental health strategy. In addition, I think we need to ensure that the laws on the books are enforced to the fullest extent. Extent. Mr. Derrick, one minute. I'm a gun owner and I support the Second Amendment. I also spent 28 years in the U.S. military, so I understand how weapons can be used responsibly and also the damage they can cause. We have a gun safety problem in this country, and that stems from the fact that we are not taking common sense steps to begin to move us in a direction where we don't have 30,000 people die every year from firearms in this country. Some things that we could do, which our Republican Congress fails to take up right now, is for example, if you're on the terrorist watch list, you should not be able to buy a weapon. Our Republican-led Congress had the opportunity to pass that legislation and did not. Another is to repeal the Dickey Amendment, which would allow us at the federal level to begin to study def gun violence and define what this problem is and how the federal government might be able to do something about it. Thank you, Mr. Derrick. Our next round is a lightning round of questions. Candidates, please respond with a yes or no or a single word or two response. We asked you about trade and TPP. Many leaders in this part of the 21st credit NAFTA for the steady growth of Canadian business and thousands of local jobs on this side of the border. Do you support NAFTA? And let's go right down the line, beginning with Ms. Stefanik. Yes. Mr. Absolutely Kuhn, not. Yes, I do. Where does expanding broadband in the Adirondack Park rank as a priority for you, Ms. Stefanik? Very high, which is why I've introduced legislation. Mr. Funicello. Three. It would be my top priority. New York is expanding medical marijuana. 25 states have it. Three are voting this November to add it. Should the federal government expand it nationwide? No. We should decriminalize all drugs and treat addiction as addiction. Yes, we should decriminalize medical marijuana. That was my next question. Five states, including Maine, Massachusetts, California, in two weeks deciding whether to join Colorado in legalizing the recreational use of marijuana. Would you support lifting the federal prohibition altogether? No. I want to end the whole drug war. Yes, I would. Do you support hydrofracking as a method to obtain natural gas? Yes. Absolutely not. I do not. Do you believe any candidate running for Congress or federal office should release their tax returns? Yes, which is why I have. Yes, which is why I will tomorrow. And yes, mine are out there. Should police officers, all police officers, be equipped with body cameras? Um, I'd like to get the feedback of our North Country police officers on that issue. Yes, they should. Yes, they should, for greater transparency. And if yes, should Congress back that up with federal funding? Yes, again, I'd like to get the feedback from our local law enforcement. Yes, and community policing as well. Yes, it should. Do you support a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United? I, I support congressional action and state action for greater transparency. I send much love to Amber and also to David Cobb for move to amend.org. Please look it up and sign on. Yes, we should because it is destroying our democracy. New York's congressional delegation is asking the Pentagon to build a missile defense site at Fort Drum. The economic benefits would be huge for the North Country. However, if the Pentagon decides a third site in the U.S. isn't warranted or needed, will you accept that? I believe this is something that the, we're going to work with on the next president. I have led the effort to ensure we are in a top position for an East Coast missile defense site. 
We need to transform ourselves to a peacetime economy, stopping the empire. No missile defense. The Fed doesn't want it. The Army doesn't want it. Union of Concerned Scientists does not want it. If the Pentagon decides we need this missile defense site, it should go at Fort Drum. It is the best site. All right. Candidates, thank you. It is now time for closing statements. We drew straws before the debate began. And Mike Derrick, uh, you will have one minute for closing statements. Thank you. Matt Funicello talks about important issues and important problems, but he does not bring realistic solutions. A vote for Matt is, in essence, a vote for Elise. Elise Stefanik and her boss, Paul Ryan, in Washington are seeking to buy this election. As I said earlier, $500,000 came into this race last week. That does not come without strings attached. She's running deceptive ads that deceive and divert the attention of the voters in our district. I urge you to vote and take back your own democracy right here in the 21st district. Don't sell this seat to the highest bidder. I am running for Congress to represent and serve all of us. There's only one seat in Congress that we have, and that seat should be held by somebody who is from and for the North Country. I humbly ask for your vote on November 8th. Thank you, Mr. Derrick. Mr. Funicello. I would like to tell you a quick anecdote instead of making a real case for voting for myself. What I will tell you is that my stepmother told me when I was a new parent that the right way to allow democracy within one's household was if I'm going to take my children to a movie, make sure that you give them a choice. You know, they can choose to go to see Willy Wonka or The Sound of Music. Uh, and that way you pick choices that you're already comfortable with. So whichever one they choose, you get what you want. Now, Maybe that works okay for parenting, but it's an extremely manipulative way to run our democracy. And that's exactly what Democrats and Republicans do. Mike talks about don't vote for the highest bidder. Don't vote for the second highest bidder either. They are both creatures of Wall Street. What you are gonna get if you vote for them, we already know. It's 50 years of war in inequality. They're not gonna fix any of the problems we have until we change the conversation in Washington, D.C., and that's why you're going to send me there on November 8th. Be brave, vote green, working class. Mr. Funichello, thank you. Ms. Stefanik. For the viewers, I'm going to take a different approach. Instead of attacking, I want to thank both of my fellow candidates, as I said in the beginning, for, have the cur for having the courage to raise their hand and stepping into the arena and sharing their views and vision for this district. We need more of that across this country. Over the past two years, I have worked incredibly hard to keep my promises to the voters in this district. I have been transparent, I have been accessible, I've been bipartisan, and I've been independent. I've focused like a laser on job creation and economic development. I've worked with our local elected officials, no matter what party they're from, which is why I'm proud to have over 600 local elected endorsements. I'm going to keep working very hard on behalf of this district, and I humbly ask for your continued support on November 8th. Thank you. And we would like to thank all three of the candidates for being here with us tonight and having a great discussion on the issues that we hope will help the voters. Ms. Stefanik, Mr. Funicello, Mr. Derrick, thank you very much for being here. We also want to thank the members of our panel who were here to ask the questions tonight. Zach Hirsch with North Country Public Radio, Joe Latemplio with the Plattsburgh Press Republican, and Matt Ryan, host of New York Now, which you can see on all of these PBS stations, including Mountain Lake PBS. Also, thanks to our colleagues at North Country Public Radio and as well, our volunteers with the League of Women Voters of the North Country who are here tonight taking care of all the timing and we appreciate them being here and continuing the partnership we've had for many, many years here at Mountain Lake PBS. And for those of you watching at home and online all across Northern New York, our thanks as well. Please do your part and get out to the polls on Tuesday, November 8th and vote. Thank you and good night.